All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. It's a genuine joy to be with you again via television. Hopefully what we have to say will prove beneficial and helpful to you in your further study of the Word of God. It's a genuine joy to share the good news of human redemption. As a matter of fact, it's the only really important thing in this world. It has to do with your eternal destiny. None of us will remain here. All of this will pass away but you and I will live forever. And that's why it's so important that we look into the Word of God to determine the way we're to order our lives. This is the love of God that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not grievous. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3. How do we express our love to God? By keeping His commandments, walking in harmony with His instruction. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves as servants unto obedience, his servant you are whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Marvelous indeed. So important that we keep the commandments of the Lord. You know, numerous passages deal with that. Let's notice several of them. That statement of the Lord in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, beginning. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will come unto me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name? In thy name cast out demons, in thy name do many mighty works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Lord, judge just a moment. Obviously, this is the scene of the judgment that you refer to in that day. These people obviously are sincere. They would not try to deceive you in the day of judgment. They feel that their lives were such that they have a place in heaven. How can you say to these good people, as the world would view goodness, I mean, they heal the sick, uh, they do everything, feed the hungry, and clothe the naked, they house the homeless. Lord, these, these are fine people. How, how can you say, uh, depart from me? Well, now listen to him. He said, I know you not. What is he saying? Friend, these people had never come into covenant relationship with the Lord. Never. You see, what the world overlooks, and especially the religious world, is that the fundamental principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ obeyed bring us into a right relationship with the Lord. But these people referred to here in Matthew 7 have joined some religious institution unknown to and unauthorized by the Word of God. Good people, oh yes, and would help you any way they could, but they are yet unsaved. As a matter of fact, in the transgression of Adam, the human family was alienated from God. Romans 5 verse 12. Therefore, through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin. So death passed unto all men, for that all have sinned. And the only way that we can come into a covenant relationship with the Lord is through the cleansing efficacy of the shed blood of His Son. Without shedding of blood is no remission, Hebrews 9.22. Impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin, Hebrews 10 at verse 4. These people had never been cleansed of the blood of Christ. Oh, what did you say, Lord? Depart from me. I never knew you. He that heareth these sayings of mine doeth them. I like unto unto a wise man building his house upon the rock. The rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon the rock. But he that heareth these things of mine and doeth them not, I'll liken him unto a foolish man building his house upon the sand. The rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall thereof. How do we build upon the rock, friend? Just simply keeping the commandments of the Lord. And as John said, his commandments are not grievous. 
they're very, very simple, and they have to do with the betterment of our lives, our happiness, the anchoring of our souls in hope. Oh, we need to hear Him, indeed. And there are numerous such passages in the Scripture having to do with our obedience to the... You recall, of course, 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Hereby we know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. He that saith, I know him, while he keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth isn't in him. Now, you remember that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, the Lord is going to render vengeance to them that know not God. Well, how may we know him so as to escape this vengeance? We just read it. Notice it. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, Hereby we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. And I remember that Jesus said in John 14 and verse 15, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. How do we show our love for Christ? Just do what He said. Marvelous that He gave His life to redeem my soul. He bore my sins upon His innocent soul that I may stand in a right relationship with God. Friends, we love Him. Oh, and that love is made manifest in simply keeping His commandments. It is so very, very important that we keep the commandments of the Lord. As a matter of fact, didn't the Hebrew writer say in chapter 5, verse 9, that he is the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him? Oh, and I remember that he said in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? He is not the Lord of your life until in humble obedience you enthrone him in your heart. Ah, then he is the Lord of your life. Wonderful indeed. John, in the book of Revelation, uh, last chapter, chapter 22, verses 18 and 19, I testify to every man that heareth the word of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add thereto, God shall add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the testimony of the prophecies of this book, God will take away his part from the tree of life. Oh, wait, wait. We need then to obey the Lord stay in harmony with His Word. Now, we could quote many, many passages that deal with the importance of keeping His commandments. You remember, of course, Second John, the only chapter beginning at verse 9. Whosoever goeth onward and abideth not in the teaching of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the teaching hath both the Father and the Son. Marvelous, isn't it? But now, <clears throat> you think about that for a moment. We could quote many other passages relative to the importance of keeping God's commandments. But we've noted enough to establish the fact that it is vital. He is the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey Him. But then let me ask you a question. To what extent will God tolerate disobedience? Uh, think about it for a moment. You remember that Paul said of the Old Testament, uh, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, whatsoever things were written beforehand were written for our learning, that through patience and through comfort of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Ah, yes, that refers, of course, to the former law. Oh, but I remember that Paul also said over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, that these things happen unto them by way of example, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages are come. So let's go back there and we can determine, I believe, whether or not God will even tolerate any portion of unbelief and disobedience. Uh, yes, there are numerous examples uh, in the Old Testament of man's uh, failure to comply with the Lord's instruction. You recall, of course, uh, <clears throat> 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Now, the setting here, Moses, uh, rather uh, David, pardon me, David has, of course, been uh, made king of all of Israel, and he has conquered the well-fortified city of Jerusalem. And there he erected a tent uh, for the Ark of the Covenant of Jehovah. And uh, it's in the house of Abinadab where it remained from the time the uh, enemies of Israel set it back on the cart, you remember, drawn uh, by the cow. Oh, he intends to bring that to Jerusalem, put it into the tent that he made. Now, so they go down and they take a new cart. They put the ark on that cart. Ahiah 
and Uzzah, who are brethren, by the way, are responsible for uh, seeing to its welfare in the transit, and uh, Ahiah is in front of it, and Uzzah is in the rear. Now, when they came to the threshing floor of Achan, those oxen that were pulling that cart stumbled. Well, Uzzah just instinctively, I mean, he reached out, he got that ark to hold it steady to keep it from falling. God slew him dead right there in the spot. What? Uzzah is trying to protect the ark. I mean, he, he loves this item that has to do with the God that he serves. It, it, what? He died. Why would that be the case? Oh, God had said, whosoever shall touch the ark will be put to death. Oh, oh. Well, Uzzah meant well, right? And I'm sure God understood that. But he touched the ark. Friend, when God speaks, that's not nearly it. That is exactly it. Now, the marvelous thing about the commandments of the Lord that have to do with my salvation is their simplicity and their broad understanding that God gives me so that I can walk in harmony with His will. But say, it is amazing. I just simply need to listen to what He has to say. Uh, he just does not tolerate uh, disobedience, not at all. If you went back to that Numbers chapter 20, uh, you recall, of course, uh, the children of Israel under the leadership of Moses are in the wilderness. They came to a place where there's insufficient water. And instead of praying to God, which they should have done, they griped about it. As a matter of fact, they reached the point they're about ready to stone Moses, set up a, ru a re leader or a ruler that'll take them back to the bondage of slavery of Egypt. Can you imagine? A people blessed by the hand of God came through the Red Sea on dry land with the waters <laughs> congealed on either side. And they got to the wilderness and, oh man, there's not enough food here. Oh, God rained manna from heaven six days out of every week to keep them alive. Or oh, their clothing didn't wear out. Their shoes waxed not old. All they had to do was talk to them. If we're not careful, we do exactly the same thing. We complain. We gripe instead of talking to our Heavenly Father, who is all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere, all of the time. I need to talk to Him. Oh, but they murmured and complained. And so Moses and Aaron went to the door of the tent of meeting, and they fell on their faces. And God said to Moses, Take thy rod, stand before the rock, and speak to the rock, and the water will come forth, and the people will drink, and their cattle. Well, Moses took his rod, and he stood before the rock, and now he's provoked. He shouldn't be. He's provoked. He said, see, you rebels, shall we bring forth water from this rock? And he smote that rock twice. Water came, and the people drank and their cattle. But God said to Moses and Aaron, because you failed to sanctify me in the eyes of this people, you will not enter the promised land. And today, and then, and since then, the location of Moses' grave has never been found. He died in the remote mountains, and God buried him in a place unknown. Mm, uh -huh. Yes, yeah, so when uh, Gabriel or uh, Michael, the archangel, uh, in uh, reasoning with the devil, uh, they spoke of the body of Moses. Even the archangel didn't know where Moses was buried. Ah, uh, God gave him a panoramic view of the land that flowed with milk and honey, but he didn't get to go in. He died. Why? God said, speak to the rock. What did he do? He smote the rock twice. Oh, you need to pay attention to what God said. Uh, speak uh, to the rock. God don't tolerate in, uh, this disobedience, uh, this indifference on man's part. It pays no attention to what he... Let's go to Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. You remember Nadab and Abihu. They were the sons of Aaron, who was the high priest. And Aaron was the brother of Moses, of course. And they were priests also. And their duty was to burn incense before the Lord. And each took his censer, put incense therein, and offered strange fire, which Jehovah commanded not. If fire came forth and Jehovah burned them to death at their post of duty. What? They offered strange fire, uh, which Jehovah commanded not. Oh, what had God said about the fire used in the service of the sanctuary? Oh, it's to come from the uh, altar at the door of the tent of meeting. 
they could, took it from somewhere else. Well, somebody said, what difference does that make? I mean, fire is fire. One fire will burn incense as well as another. That's beside the point. That has nothing to do with it. Your well-being is contingent upon your obedience to God Almighty. Oh, then I need to know what the Lord said and uh, seek to do that. Right. You are aware that all authority resides in God the Father, who is the creator of this material universe, right? Oh, but he delegated his authority to Christ, as he said, Matthew 28, verse 18, all authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. And then you recall after his resurrection, just before his ascension, he said in Mark 16, verse 15, speaking to his apostles, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, Lord, uh, uh, these, these men are not uh, highly educated. They, they don't have a degree. I mean, they're just common uh, workers, uh, intelligent, fine men, but uh, some of them were fishermen. One of them was a tax collector. I mean, they just came from various, Lord, when you send these people into the world to preach your gospel, who's going to believe them? I mean, oh, 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 that's why he continued. Listen to this. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Oh, he that believeth not shall be condemned. Oh, and these signs shall accompany them that believe. In my name shall they cast out demons. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall in no wise hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Well, well, just what's he saying? The authority that God delegated to Jesus, he has partially delegated to these apostles. He gives them miraculous gifts, the ability to confirm the word that they teach. You know, when you raise a dead man, somebody's going to open his eyes. <laughs> man can't do that. Only God can do that. Oh, well, then that was the verification of the message that they proclaimed. And various miracles were, were. As a matter of fact, these apostles, through the power given them by the Lord, had the ability to lay their hands on the faithful men in the church and bestow certain gifts. First Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 11, Paul catalogued some, oh, eight or nine of these miraculous gifts. And then he said in the last verse of chapter 12, Desire earnestly the greater gift, yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Ah, if I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, but I have not love, profiteth me nothing. Mm. If I have the gift of prophecy, have all knowledge, know all mysteries, have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. If I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, if I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not, love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not its own. Ah, ha, ha. beareth all things, believeth all things. Verse 8, love never faileth. Now listen, but whether there be prophecies, they shall be done away. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall be done away. Well, oh, wait a minute, Paul. Are you saying a time will come when men won't be able to teach? They won't be able to speak? They'll, no, 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 no. These are three of the miraculous gifts that he cataloged in chapter 12, verses 4 through 11, representative of all of these miraculous gifts. So he said, when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. He said, we know in part, prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is... What is that which is perfect, friend? When the time arrives that each man has the sum total of God's divine revelation, oh, then that which is in part, the miraculous gifts. One man had this gift, another man had that gift, still another man had yet another gift. These were to be used cumulatively for the progress of the cause of Christ. Now, those gifts are not necessary today because the word of the Lord has been confirmed by miraculous uh, doing. Uh -huh. Oh, that which is confirmed needs no further confirmation. So in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, every scripture inspired of God is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly, thoroughly, that's completely furnished unto every good work. Oh, so today we have the sum total of God's divine message, right? And this scripture inspired of God furnishes the man of God in every area of life, right? Well, how about then going with me 
to Ephesians 5, verse 19. It's speaking one to another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, uh, singing and making melody with your heart unto the Lord. What's that? Speaking one to another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing, making melody with your heart unto the Lord. Uh, how is it that today uh, a lot of people are using uh, mechanical instruments of music? Oh, someone said, well, now, you know, <clears throat> this singing would sound better if it had the accompaniment of an organ or a, a piano. Friend, you'll lose your soul. What? God said, the instrument to be used is the heart. Oh, not a stringed instrument, uh, not an organ, not a piano. Uh, well, if you went to Colossians 3 at verse uh, 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing, making melody with your heart unto the Lord. Do what? Singing, the fruit of lips, Hebrews 13, verse 15. Oh, singing, making melody with your heart. You know, the New Testament teaches in three different ways that direct command by necessary inference. Oh, and by divinely approved example. When you read the New Testament very carefully and very thoroughly, and you can go through it three or four times, and that would be good, uh, you, you don't find any command for the use of mechanical instruments of music. No, no. Nor do you find any situation in the last will and testament of the Son of God where you're almost forced to conclude that mechanical instruments of music were you. Notice her. There's nothing like that even hinted at in the Word of God. Say. Oh, and there is no divinely approved example of the use of mechanical instruments of music in worship. You know, it is a tragedy beyond description that a few congregations, even of the Lord's church, I mean overseen by elders, men who should be qualified in the knowledge of God's divine revelation, who have the responsibility directly from the Almighty to guide that congregation according to the truth. And they have allowed or even authorized and suggested that we have mechanical instruments of music in certain portions of our worship. Can you imagine? Well, somebody says, uh, that really don't make any difference with the Lord. Ah, friend, friend, yes, sir, makes a difference with the Lord. God does not tolerate sin. He does not tolerate the violation of his will. You see, his will is very simple, readily understood, no problems at all. He doesn't try to complicate it to confuse the human mind. He makes it just as clear as can be. What do we do with our uh, singing? We teach and admonish one another with the words that we use uh, set to music, and that's fine. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, what is the instrument that we employ in uh, providing this uh, music and thus pleasing the Lord? Uh, the heart. Yes, sir. The heart. I had a lady one time say, that preacher doesn't have good sense. He talks about his heart and points to his head. <laughs> you know, that's where the heart of the Bible is located. This is a blood pump. A uh, problem there will necessitate a visit to your physician. You need to talk about the heart, the intellect, the emotions, and the will. That's all above the shoulders. Good people, we need to give close attention to the instruction contained in God's Word. If you employ a mechanical instrument of music in your worship to God, you are in violation of His Word. Does he accept that? Uh, does God tolerate error on my part? Uh, since I'm a basically good fellow, you know, friend, I don't make the law. I'm a sinner, redeemed by the shed blood of the Son of God. And that was made available by the unmerited favor of the Almighty. God so loved sinners such as I that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, and that belief is made manifest how? 
oh, this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. I, as faith without works, is dead, uh, James 2, verse 26. So I need to comply with the Lord's teaching. What's that called? That's called faith. Yes, sir. That's the only way that I can please the Lord. Faith cometh of hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So that I need to be sure that I'm walking in harmony with the Lord's will. Uh, this concept of mechanical instruments of music. Now, if you are over in the barn somewhere, or maybe even in the living room, and, and you've got some kind of a song, and it's entertaining, well, fine, that's all. But if you are assembled in the congregation of the Lord's people. You are there in the divine presence for the purpose of worship. Friend, the only thing God will accept in your thinking and your obedience is His Word. It's a singing, making melody with your hearts unto the Lord. Ah, uh, that's the way it's done. And you know that brings great consolation to the mind of man. Friend, read the book, Apply Only the Law of the Lord. James Watkins has taught us the Word of God for so many years. But friends, we'd love for you to study further. We have a Bible correspondence course that is available free of charge. Nothing costs to you whatsoever. If you'll write us at the address that's shown on the screen or call us at the number also that is on the screen at this time, we'd be thrilled to be able to study with you in this particular way. Brother Watkins teaches the Word of God in truth and simplicity. I'm so thankful that he has done this on this program for so many years. But friends, your soul is important. You need to prepare to meet God to be a child of God, to follow the will of God. And now let's go back to Brother Watkins. Friends, let me urge you to look into the Word of God. It isn't difficult to understand. And in seeing the examples that are set forth and the disobedience of man in many instances, and on occasion in those instances of disobedience, the human mind would say, well, it, it seems like that wouldn't really make any... Be aware that God does not tolerate disobedience, and His will is readily understood. So I need simply to study His Word, put it into practice, do my best to stay in harmony with the instruction contained herein. It isn't difficult. It's very, very simple. And it's a wonderful thing that God has done to provide through the death of His Son for my salvation. Then surely I can follow His instruction. May God bless.